Hey, Calvary family. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Pastor Kendra, and we are so happy you're here to worship with us. If you haven't downloaded our app yet, take a second to do so now. You'll find everything you need to know, like sermon notes, bulletins, previous sermons, daily or weekly reminders to get into God's word, and so much more. Once again, we're so glad you're here. Let's worship the Lord together. Good morning, Calvary. Happy Palm Sunday. Would you get on your feet? Let's get ready to worship the Lord today. Come on, let's put our hands together.
Worshipfully take your seats as we partake in communion. If you haven't received the elements, just put your hands up. Some of our ushers will come down 
and get you some. For those who are online, if you want to pause the video here, grab some juice, some crackers, some bread, something, so you can join us as well. Isaiah chapter 53 reads like this. Surely he borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Anyone have grief and sorrow here today? Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. It is because of the work on the cross. Now whatever it is you have here today, whatever sin you're dealing with, whatever grief, whatever sorrow you have, whatever burden, whatever sickness, whatever disease, by his stripes, we are healed in Jesus' name. If you would take the bread in your hand, let's pray. Heavenly Father, <laughs> Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your body was broken so that we could be made whole that our wholeness, our completeness comes from nowhere else but you because of what you did on the cross. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for taking upon yourself what should have been ours. In Jesus' name, let's take the bread. And Lord, we thank you for your blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. God, I thank you that there is no sin too heavy, no sin too great that the power of your blood cannot extinguish. There is no sin too grand that your blood cannot cover. And I, I thank you, Lord, because I know me. I, I, I know the things that I have, but I thank you that the same blood that was spilt 2,000 years ago still has power today. We remember and we are thankful in Jesus' name. Let's take the cup together. Hallelujah. Would you stand with us as we continue in worship of our Lord?
love to take their place with selfless faith, with selfless faith. I see you near, I see you near gates wide to let the king of glory come in God we stand here and we acknowledge fully that you are king of kings and lord of lords and that you are among us here and now and I am thankful because when the king walks into the building everything that is not of him must bow down and God, I pray here and now in Jesus' name that all sickness, disease, God, every emotion that is not of you, every feeling that we have, Lord God, that is not in alignment and agreement with your word, I pray in the name of Jesus that it would bow down in Jesus' name. And that you, almighty king, would move among us. You would move and allow your kingdom to reign. God, I pray that you would touch every heart and every life, not just here. God, but for those who are listening and watching at home, Father, I pray that you would do 
do what you do best. Heal those who are sick. Open blind eyes, Lord. I pray every chain fall to the ground in the name of Jesus. Save those who are lost, Lord God. We haven't come here, Lord, just to come as ritual. We've come here to meet with the King of glory. And so do among us. Do among us what only you can do. And we will be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise that you and you alone are due. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, everybody said, come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus in this building today. Glory to your name, Jesus. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We magnify you. We lift you up. You are greater. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Woo. Woo. Let me calm. I'm going to calm down. I'm going to calm down. Today is going to be an incredible day. You guys can be seated. Uh, my name is Pastor Clark. I am the young adults pastor here, and I just have the privilege to welcome you uh, who are here in person. Those of you who are watching online, thank you so much for being here. Before we move any further, I would like to recognize someone special to our church family whose birthday is coming up this Thursday. Uh, Pastor Charles's wife, Lena. Lena, are you in the building today? Where you at? Is she here? There she is. Ma'am, would you come up? Give it up for Lena. Happy birthday, dear. We have some flowers for you. Praying this year would be a blessed one, that you would receive everything that God has for you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Give it up one more time for Lena. Oh man, the Lord is here. The Lord is here. If you I, don't miss him today, he's here and he wants to do something in your life. You at home, don't miss him today. He wants to do something in your life. Amen. Check out these announcements. Hey, Calvary family, Pastor Kendra here again and want to wish you a very happy Palm Sunday. We want to take a moment to welcome any of our first time guests, either in person or online. Take a moment to connect with us by texting CALVARYCC to 97000 or by scanning the QR code in the seat back in front of you. If you're here in person, be sure to join us after service in the Welcome Center where our team will be waiting to welcome you to our church family. Here at Calvary, we are always looking to grow in our walk with Jesus. So if that's you, it's time to get connected and discover where you belong. God has something for you as you enter into community with others. Check out the complete list of upcoming groups and classes beginning in April at the link below. You are also invited to attend the Christian Family Resource Conference hosted at Liberty Church in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. They are partnering with the New England Dream Center to bring this year's theme, Everyday Faith, so much more than Sundays. If you're a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, family, friend, teacher, pastor, or anyone that has direct influence in the development and discipleship of children from infancy through adolescence, make plans to attend on Friday, April 26th and Saturday, April 27th. The next generation needs us and we need each other. Together, let's find support and strength as we strive to lead and love our children and families in Christian faith. The Christian Family Resource Conference has been designed to encourage, equip, and inspire Christian families through instruction and insight from a biblical worldview. Pre-registration is required and can be completed at the link below. And lastly, this Easter season brings us Calvary Theater's Easter showing of The Promise. On the eve of getting a new sibling, two sisters journey back in time as their grandpa reveals the powerful story of Jesus. What did Jesus coming as a baby have to do with them? Join us as we find out together and witness the life of Jesus and his disciples unfold right before our eyes. You won't want to miss this year's performances featuring live animals, special effects, and gripping musical performances. 
Admission is free and childcare is provided for children five years and younger. Pick up your tickets and your flyers in the foyer. Invite everybody you know, family, friends, coworkers, and more. You can visit the link below to learn more. Please keep in mind that seating is first come, first serve, so it's imperative that you arrive early. Once we've reached maximum capacity, the doors will be closed and remaining guests will no longer be able to attend that showing. Doors open at half hour before the show begins. We can't wait to see you there. Well, family, that's all we have for video announcements today. Be sure to take a look at our Calvary app to see other events and resources we have for you. But for now, let's head back into service together. Hey, before, before Pastor Clark comes here today to receive the offering, I know we just celebrated a birthday, uh, but somebody had a birthday earlier this month and wasn't here the Sunday of their birthday, so we missed the opportunity. And it wasn't just any birthday, it was one of those big birthdays with a zero at the end. In fact, it's one of the, it's the one where we give the halftime uh, book to them. And so I need your guys' help here this morning as we wish Pastor Clark a very happy and belated 40th birthday. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Well, we're going to continue in worship uh, by receiving the Lord's tithe and our offering. Listen, everything that you give enables us as a church to do what God has called us to do, to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so thank you for partnering with us as we endeavor to do that and see his name, his name be famous on the earth. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, we recognize that 100% of what we have belongs to you. You've given it to us to steward well. And Lord, here and now as we receive this offering, I pray that we would truly be cheerful givers, understanding that everything that we give goes to advancing your kingdom, not just here on the North Shore of Boston, but around the world. And God, we pray, we pray that we would come to that understanding, knowing that we have partnered with you in your mission. And we'd be careful to give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise that you and you alone are due. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Thank you for your faithfulness and giving. to 
zealots, men like Barabbas, and that now famous Maccabean. But this Jesus, this new champion, was riding into Jerusalem on a donkey as Zechariah had envisioned him. This king was coming to daughter Zion to take the wicked Roman chariots away from Ephraim. Surely this Jesus was the one to bring God's people salvation. Surely he was the one pictured all across the prophet's hopeful panorama. So they shouted, save us, please. They cried, Hosanna, Hosanna. And this Jesus would answer yes to their cry of save us, save us, but not in the way they expected, not by the violent overthrow predicted by their palmy political propaganda. For the humility of that donkey was nothing compared to the way he would answer their shouts of Hosanna. For the path on which he rode took him not to a throne, but to a court, not to a place fit for a heavenly king, but to the feet of an earthly Lord. It was there before another crowd in the hands of Pilate, whom God endowed with the power to answer the shouts rising loud, demanding crucifixion for this man who was so recently avowed as Hosanna by those who had laid down a pathway of both palm branch and personal shroud. It was there that he would show how he would answer both crowds, both the Hosanna save us cry and the incessant crucify. For what was missed by each tribe, by those who cried out their Hosanna boast and those who cried that this man should be nailed upon two posts, is that Jesus would say no to neither request. Instead, he would say yes to both. In fact, he would accomplish salvation by such infliction. He would be Hosanna by undergoing crucifixion. He would say yes to cries of love and yes to cries of hate. And for us, it is good news that he answered this way. For we too cry Hosanna. We too need to be saved. But we also cry crucify him. We also are filled with hate. We need to be rescued from our evil, but when goodness comes to us, we take what is good and by our evil, hang it on a cross. But this is how 
he saves us. This is how he loves us. He answered our cry of need and our cry of hate with one final yes poured out as he cried so that the sin that put him on the cross he paid for as he died and the salvation for which we asked by his yes he supplied. So come lay down your branches and come lift up your palms for the king of our salvation said yes to the night of death so that he could raise the light of dawn. Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 through 11 as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them go into the village ahead of you And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread uh, their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Who is this? No question is more important for us to ask than the one that Matthew reports that the whole city of Jerusalem was asking on that first Palm Sunday. I mean, there's a lot of important questions to ask in this life. Questions like, who am I going to marry or where am I going to live or what am I going to do vocationally for a job? There are lots of important questions to ask in this life, but none of them is more important than who is this? Who is this man that we read about in our text here today? No question is more important to ask and no question is more important to get the right answer to. The the, the question that we're asking uh, in our text here today, who is this? The people in our text, they answered that question by saying this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. But who is Jesus? Today in our world, there's a lot of differing opinions on who Jesus was or more accurately who Jesus is. Some believe that he was merely a good teacher or some kind of moral philosopher. Someone who offered valuable insights on how to live a a good life, but someone whose reputation goes well beyond the truth. And all that stuff about his divinity and the miracles that he did, his, his resurrection were simply exaggerated. Some believe that only parts of Jesus' life were made up. Some believe that everything about Jesus is a myth, that it's just a story that was made up by those first Christians. Others believe that he is real, but that he's just one among many prophets or holy figures, one among many gods. Some actually see Jesus as an intolerant figure. I mean, he is the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Basically saying, follow me, because any other way that you choose to go is wrong and leads to death. These are all different views of Jesus. So who really is Jesus? Again, there is no question that's more important for us to ask, and there is no more important for us question for us to answer. And although it's always a great time to ask and answer this question, there is no more perfect time to ask and answer it than the week that we find ourselves in right now. 
Holy Week. This week that we kick off today, Palm Sunday, has really rightly been called Holy Week throughout much of church history. It goes back to at least the 4th century and one of our early church fathers, Athanasius. Some refer to it as Holy Week. Some refer to it as Passion Week. Passion coming from the Latin word meaning suffering, referring to the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Holy Week or Passion Week, it commences on Palm Sunday to mark Jesus' dramatic uh, entry into Jerusalem. And then the the suffering, the death, the burial of Jesus, we commemorate on Good Friday. And then finally, on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, we celebrate the fact that we we serve, we serve a risen king. I, I hope that you will not miss next Sunday. I hope that you will be here to help us and worship with us as we celebrate our Savior's resurrection. Next week is really the most important Sunday on all of our church calendar. Without Easter, without uh, the resurrection, there really isn't much left of this Christian faith. So I hope that you will be here to, to celebrate and to worship with us. But this Holy Week provides the perfect opportunity for us to ask and hopefully answer, who is this? Who is Jesus? And our passage today gives us at least three answers to this most important question. And the first is simply this, Jesus is our great teacher. Matthew chapter 21, verse 11 says, the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus was a prophet. What is a prophet? It is someone who speaks for God. It is someone who declares and explains and teaches God's word and God's will to his people. And the people saw that Jesus was a prophet. They had heard that he was a teacher, but there were some who were there that first Palm Sunday that they didn't just see Jesus as a prophet. No, they were beginning to wonder if he was the prophet. The prophet that had been prophesied about years and years before, multiple times in the Old Testament, in places like Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where it says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. You must listen to him. The people knew that there was a special prophet, a special teacher that was promised long ago, someone that must be listened to because he spoke, because he taught with God's authority. And some that day might have been just thinking that Jesus was just another prophet like John the Baptist, but some had begun to see that Jesus wasn't just another prophet, that he was the greatest prophet, that he was the greatest teacher. John chapter 6, verse 14 says, And after the people saw the signs that Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who came, who is to come into the world. You see, the people, they saw the miracles that Jesus performed and concluded that he must be the great teacher that they were waiting for. The people heard the lessons that Jesus taught and they concluded that Jesus must be the one who was promised. The people saw the life that Jesus lived and concluded that God himself was among them and that he needed to be listened to, that the lessons that he taught needed to be learned and to be lived out. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't come just to teach the people of the first century. He wasn't just a teacher for those who were there on that first Palm Sunday. No, he wants to teach you and me today as well. I've had many great teachers in my life. I've had my parents, I've had youth pastors and and pastors and, and mentors like Pastor Tim and others. But as great as they are, there is one teacher that is better than all of them combined, and that is Jesus. The people on that first Palm Sunday realized that he was the prophet, that he was the teacher. He was someone who was worthy to be followed. But do we feel the same way today? 
Can I ask you something? Who is the teacher in your life? This week, I had the privilege of having Pastor Ben come and and share with a group of young leaders that I've been meeting with monthly here at the church. And and, and he shared lots of things, many things that just blew my mind and, and made me think. If you've ever wondered who's the smartest associate pastor here, it's definitely Pastor Ben He's the smartest, he's the, the deepest, and he came and he, he challenged us. And there was a lot of things that, that he shared that I've been, I've been thinking about. But one thought that has really stuck with me this whole week is that every day, every day, we are all being taught, we are all being formed, we are all being shaped by someone or something. For some people, it's CNN that's shaping their opinions. For others, it's Fox News that's forming their worldview. For many, it's Facebook or Instagram. They look at what other people value and what other people say is important, and then they deem that to be important in their own lives as well. Some look to friends, for good or for bad. Some look to friends to help them find their way through life. Others are being shaped by their family, their family's beliefs, their family's values, their family's traditions. We are all being shaped by someone or something. Family, friends, teachers, school, media, social media, technology, movies, video games, peers, coworkers, pastors, celebrities, sports stars, politicians, culture, society. We are all being shaped by someone or something every day. Can I ask you something? Who is shaping your life? Who is the teacher in your life? The reality is, is that there's many things that point us in the wrong direction. Some things that seriously send us in the wrong direction. There is only one teacher that leads us into all truth. There is only one who always points us in the right way, and that is Jesus. John chapter 16, verse 13 says, but when he... The spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. This verse right here, it underscores, it underlines our belief that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, desires to continue to speak and to teach us even to today. The question is, is who is the teacher in our lives? Whose voice are we listening to? Who are we allowing to form and to shape our lives? Is it Jesus or is it someone else? There's only one who can lead us into all truth, and that is Jesus. The people on that first Palm Sunday, they discovered it. They said, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. The people on that first Palm Sunday, they discovered it. The question is whether we recognize that in our own lives. Do we recognize that Jesus is the great teacher? Are we following him? Are we listening to him? Are we being shaped by him? Or are we being shaped by someone else? something else. First, Jesus is our great teacher. Second, Jesus is our great savior. Matthew chapter 21, verse nine, it says, the crowds went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The crowds, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, a phrase meaning, oh, save. They were saying, Jesus, save us. Now, many on that day had the wrong idea of uh, of how Jesus was coming to save. Many perhaps thought Jesus had come to liberate Jerusalem and the people from Roman oppression. Many in that crowd, no doubt, were were thinking only of a physical and a, a military liberation. But Jesus wasn't riding into Jerusalem to save them from an earthly empire. Jesus wasn't riding into Jerusalem uh, to, uh, to, to get them away from the Roman Empire. No, Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to save them from a spiritual kingdom. He came not on a war horse, but he came on a lowly donkey. 
He was undertaking a different kind of triumphal entry than what the crowd was expected. Again, Jesus didn't come to save them from an earthly empire. He came to triumph over a spiritual kingdom, to triumph over an enemy, to triumph over sin, and to bring salvation to his people through his sacrifice on the cross. And this same Jesus who would die on the cross that very week for those people's sins, he is still able to save us from our sins today as well. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 24 and 25 says, but Jesus, but because Jesus lives forever, he's alive, we'll celebrate it next week. Because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God Through him, because he always lives. Again, he's alive. He always lives to intercede for them. Because Jesus lives forever, because he rose from the dead, he is able to save completely because he always lives. Present tense, always lives to intercede for us. The reality is, is that we've all messed up, that we have all sinned. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes me and that includes you. We are all in need of God's forgiveness and there is only one who can save. It's kind of like this. In our lives, again, we've all made mistakes, we've all sinned, we've all messed up, and when sin comes into our lives, whatever it is we do, we lie, we see, we chill, we steal, whatever it may be, we come in and it affects our, our whole life, it permeates our whole, we are, we are a sinner. And there is nothing that we can do to take care of our own sin. There's nothing that we can do to deal with our own sin. We can try. We can try to get it out by ourselves, but that doesn't do anything. We can put in a ton of effort and trying to be the best person we want to be to get it out. I don't know, helping old ladies across the street, whatever we want to do, you know. But nothing that we do will ever get this sin. There's no way for us to get this out. We are a sinner. Our life has been polluted. And that's why this week we're celebrating this Holy Week, this Passion Week. What we're celebrating is that Jesus gave his life. He died on the cross. He took all of the, the, the sins of the world, all of the, all of the, of the lying and the, and the cheating and the, and the stealing and the lustfulness and the hatred and malice. He took all of the sins of the world and he, he took them on himself. And when he was on that cross, he dealt with all of the sins of the whole world. And he conquered death, he conquered hell, he conquered grave, he conquered sin. And sin is no more because of what Jesus did. This is finished. This is complete. This is dealt with. Here's the thing, though. There's still one more step. This is done. It's complete. It's finished. But you remember that verse we just read in Hebrews? It says he can save everyone who comes to him. We still have to come to him. We still have to invite him in, into our heart and into our life. And when Jesus comes into our heart and our life and we trust him as our, uh, as our savior, he comes in and all that sin that was in our life, again, all that hatred, he, he, he forgives that sin. He, he takes care of that sin and he begins to extract that sin from our life and he makes us pure and holy again. We couldn't do it on our own, but Jesus can. Can I ask you something today? Who is your Savior? If we're trying to deal with our own sin in our own way, we can't. There's nothing we can do to deal with our own sin. If we're trusting in anyone else or anything else, that will never set us free. There's only one thing that can set us free. There's only one person that can set us free, and that is Jesus. Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 puts it this way. It says, Jesus is the cornerstone, the stone that you you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
Who is your Savior? See, I believe that there's a lot of people today, perhaps even a lot of people in this room or with us online today, who are saying, they are praying, they are shouting, Hosanna, save me. My life is a mess. Save me. I don't know what to do. Save me. I've screwed up. Save me. We know that we need to be saved. We know that we can't do it on our own. We've tried. We know that we need help. We know that we need a Savior. Today, let me tell you something. Jesus and Jesus alone is our great Savior. In just a few minutes when we conclude this service, I'm, I'm going to give us all the opportunity to pray. And if you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor Jamie, I, I know that I need a Savior. I'd like to begin to follow Christ today in just a moment. I'm going to invite you to pray with me and invite, uh, and invite Jesus to become your Savior today. So you can even begin to prepare yourself now. So this Palm Sunday, we remember first that Jesus is our great teacher. Second, that he is our great Savior. And thirdly and finally that Jesus is our great king. Matthew chapter 21, verse 8. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Some uh, uh, who were in the crowd that day, they threw garments at, in Jesus' path, just as they would throw garments or carpets in honor of a literal earthly king. Symbolizing their submission, they're symbolizing the, the king's authority over them. Others, they, they cut palm branches from the trees and, and spread them on the road before Jesus. Palms symbolizing Jewish nationalism and, and victory. And as they were spreading their garments and palms uh, that day, looking at Jesus, many may have been thinking of the, again, of those old prophecies come of a coming king. Prophecies like Genesis 49, 10, where, uh, when Jacob prophesied of a kingly Messiah who would come and reign as king. It says in Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until, uh, until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. And the obedience of the nations shall be his. The people were looking for a king. They were looking for a conquering king. And Jesus would conquer. He would just conquer in a way that they were not expecting. Again, he rode not on a war horse. He rode on a lowly donkey. He went not to a throne room, but to a cross. He wore a crown. But it wasn't the crown that they were expecting. It wasn't made of gold. It was made of thorns. Jesus was, he wasn't the king that they were expecting. And perhaps that's why they so quickly went from chanting Hosanna to crucify him. You see, the people were looking for Jesus to do what in their minds good earthly kings are supposed to do, to give them hope, to give them vision, to give them direction for a future, to keep them safe, to protect the people, to serve the people, to deliver the people from tyranny. That's what a good king does. And and Jesus is a good king. Jesus is the, the great king. In fact, Revelation 19, 16, it says, and on his robe and On his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Not just King and Lord, King of Kings, Great King. Not just Lord, Lord of Lords, the Great Lord. And so he would deliver the people like a good king does. But Jesus, again, he doesn't just, he didn't come to offer some earthly temporary victory. No, he came to offer ultimate victory in life and the promise of eternal life. You see, Jesus offers guidance and direction, guidance that will never lead us astray. Jesus, the great King, offers us purpose and meaning. He offers us peace and hope. He offers us community and belonging. He offers us transformation and renewal. Jesus is the best King. Jesus is the great King. Why would we ever want to follow anyone else? 
Why would we ever want to trust in anyone else? Can I ask you something here today? Who is your king? Who are you trusting in? Where does your loyalty really lie? Maybe you're your own king, following your own plan, living life your own way. Maybe you look to someone else to give you purpose and meaning in life, a a spouse, a child, or someone else. Maybe you look to something else to give you purpose and meaning, a, a job, a hobby, money, fame, fortune, whatever it is. Who is your king? Who do you serve in this life? There's only one that is truly worth following. There is only one who is truly worth trusting, and his name is Jesus. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, it's the triumphal entry. It's it's one short passage, just 11 verses. But it's a passage that highlights Jesus as our great teacher, our great Savior, our great king. And the fact that Matthew 21 highlights all three of these things about Jesus shows how how great of a Messiah he really is. You see, if we go all the way back to the Old Testament, the role of prophet and and teacher, the the, the role of priest, the the role of of king, they were understood to be uh, fulfilled by three separate individuals. The prophet, wasn't the king, the the king wasn't the priest. Three separate people, three separate roles. No one person could ever do all three. It was just too much. If one person were ever to fill all three positions, he would have to be, they would have to be an extraordinary person. And that is exactly who the gospel of Matthew shows Jesus to be an extraordinary person. All three offices, teacher, Savior, King, coming together in one person, Jesus, our Messiah, our all-sufficient Savior. Theologian J.I. Packer, talking about this idea, he says it this way. He says, it is his glory given him by the Father to be in this way the all-sufficient Savior. We who believe are called to understand this and to show ourselves to be his people by obeying him as our king, trusting in him as our savior, and learning from him as our prophet and teacher. To center on Jesus Christ in this way is the hallmark, it is the definition of authentic Christianity. To center on Jesus this way, to live our lives with Jesus as our, as our teacher, as our Savior, and our Lord is the hallmark. It is the definition of authentic Christianity. To view Jesus and to center our lives around Jesus, again, as our teacher, our Savior, our King, that is what Christianity is all about. And if Jesus isn't any of those things to you, he isn't your your teacher, he isn't your savior, he isn't your king, then you are not following Christ. But also, if Jesus is your teacher, but he isn't your king, then that's not authentic Christianity either. And if Jesus is your savior, but you don't let him teach you and lead you and guide you, then that is not authentic Christianity either. Authentic Christianity is fully obeying Jesus as king, trusting in him as savior, and learning from him daily as our teacher. Can I ask you a question today? Are you living an authentic Christian life? Who is your teacher? Who is shaping your life? We are all being shaped by someone or something. Is it really Christ that shapes us in each and every way? Who is your Savior? Monday to Friday, who are you trusting in? Are you trusting in Christ? Are you even thinking about Christ? Who is your King? Who do you really serve? Is Jesus truly your number one priority? As we walk into this holy week, my prayer for us all is that we would all see clearer than ever before who Jesus really is. Teacher, Savior, King. 
My prayer for us all is the same as the Apostle Paul who prayed in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, for this reason, I, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that, they may be, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. My prayer this holy week is that we would see Christ, like Paul talks about here, clearer than ever before. That we would see how wide and deep is the love of Christ for us, a love that would drive him to the cross of Calvary. I pray that this Passion Week, this holy week, that we would all come to see Jesus and to follow Jesus as our great teacher our great Savior, and our great King. And I pray that if someone were to ask us, who is this? Who is this Jesus? That we would all be able to reply, he is my teacher who never leads me astray. He is my King and he is my Savior. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful. We're thankful for this holy week. We're thankful for the reminder of your love for us, a love that held nothing back. Lord, we cannot wait to be here next Sunday to celebrate your resurrection to worship you. But Lord, today here on this Palm Sunday, as we look at the triumphal entry, Lord, we are reminded that you are the greatest teacher God, that you are the great Savior and that you are the great King. And Lord, I pray that you would, for all of us here, God, that you would just make that so real to us this week. God, may we see you, may we see your love, may we see your greatness clearer than ever before this Holy Passion Week. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just to afford everybody privacy, Maybe you're here today. You stumbled into this church for the first time. Somebody invited you. You were driving by. You found us online. You're here for the first time. Maybe you've been coming for years. Maybe you have never had a relationship with God or you had one, but if you were honest today, you're just not very close to Him. But you're here today and and you'd like to say, Pastor, I would like to begin or I would like to renew my relationship with with Christ. I would love the opportunity to, to pray for you today to pray with you today to begin a new relationship with Christ. And and I just love to know who I'm praying for. And and nobody's looking around but me. But if you're here today and you'd like to begin to follow Christ as as your great great teacher, as your Savior, as your your King, as your Lord, I just love to pray with you. And if you'd be bold enough just to raise your hand. Is there anybody here today? I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody here today? I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. See your hand in the back there. See your hand in the back there, up in the balcony. See your hand there, ma'am. Anybody who's here today, today you, I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody who's here today, today you would like to begin a relationship with God or renew, I just love to pray for you. I don't want to miss anybody. Anybody else who's here today? Lord, for these seven, eight, or however many hands that are raised here today, God, I pray that they would truly from this day forward, this week, this holy week, this passion week, and every week to come, God, that they would that they would trust in you, God, that they would learn from you as their great teacher, God, that you, they would, uh, they would just trust in you as their great savior, Lord, and that they would place you first place in their life, God, that you would be the king of their life, Lord. Lord, I, I pray that you solidify this decision upon their heart today and from this moment forward, they'd follow you with everything inside them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'm going to invite you all to stand with me. The worship team is going to come and they're going to lead us in a closing time of worship as they do. There's some altar workers who are here at the front. They would love the opportunity to pray with you, to pray for you. 
And so as we, uh, as we all close out by, by singing another chorus, I'd invite you to come. You can pray with one of these altar workers. You can just find a place to pray here at the altar, especially if you're one of those who raised your hand. And if you're one of those who raised your hand saying, I want to begin a relationship with God. I want to renew a relationship with Christ as we're all responding. I'd invite you to come and find one of these altar workers. They'd love to pray with you again. They got a gift they'd love to give you about these first steps in following Christ. And, and then when we all feel that uh, the, the Spirit's released us, we're, we're free to go. I hope that you'll be back with us next Sunday as we celebrate our Savior's uh, resurrection. If you're visiting with us for the first time, if you're a guest here today, we'd love uh, to meet you over in our Welcome Center. Some of our staff will be over there. We've got a gift we'd love to give you. But again, as the worship team leads us, let's all respond here today.
It's yours, it's yours, it's yours, all 